Hello and welcome uh, to this discussion on the novel The Tamarind History by uh, Sundar Ramasamy. I want to begin this uh, discussion by bringing your attention to uh, one of the commentaries on this novel and this is the blurb on um, Penguin's Modern Classics. If you turn uh, to the back cover, uh, you will find these ideas. With a narrative breadth never seen, uh, never before seen in Tamar fiction, Sundar Ramasamy's Tamaran history inaugurated a new era in Tamar letters. Its meditations on the loss of beloved places, the shared experience of the past, the meaning of togetherness amid struggle, ambition and enmity all flow from the life of an aged tamarind tree that stands at the center of a bustling town. This town's wild places, their mythic past, still treasured by an old wanderer and the youth who listen to his tales are stripped away as politicians commit to modernization in the name of progress. Yet the town remains filled with life and beauty even as it is irrevocably damaged. So, uh, if you think about this commentary, it's a beautiful commentary on life and loss, right? Um, you can challenge some of the opinions um, which are part of this take on the novel. If you go to um, the last line, yet the town remains filled with beauty and life even as it is irrevocably damaged, that's open for debate. What continues to be beautiful in this town uh, is a, a subject that needs to be probed and, and um, uh, noted, right? Uh, it's difficult to find the beauty uh, of this small town once um, modernization sets in, right? And some would argue even prior to that, even prior to that, the aesthetics the aesthetics which frame life in that small town is a problematic aesthetic to some, right? So uh, you, you need to understand what is aesthetics, what is uh, truly beautiful, you need to have an understanding of that and um, apply it and try to read this particular small town life from your understanding of aesthetics and once again there's no one standard uh, theory on aesthetic which you may find appealing what is beauty is open to interpretation right so it's it's a complex nature of beauty if there is beauty in this small town um, that we get narrated through the eyes of figures such as Damodra Asan, the narrator and, and Joseph and other characters that we see milling around in this town, right? I want to go back to this um, idea of meditations. It's meditations on the laws of beloved places. That's definitely there, right? Um, if you go to chapter um, 3, you, you find um, the tamarind tree being threatened by Copeland, right? Um, it, it is, quote unquote, a beautiful place for figures such as Damodar Asan and his youthful followers. And, and that beloved place is threatened. And again, in chapter 4, you find the Kashrina Grove, uh, which is uh, destroyed. Uh, in order to set in motion the narrative of progress, right? So uh, there are meditations uh, on, on the beauty of such uh, wild places, right? Uh, and, and if if you read the chapter pretty closely, you will see how the uh, aesthetic of the wild is established and then you move on to uh, the destruction, right? So there is uh, the past or the glory, uh, the glorified past and the, um, you know, the modern present in the same chapter and uh, the narrator asks you to kind of judge between these two uh, extremes, right? Um, I call it extremes uh, for certain reasons, which I will share with you uh, shortly. 
wild places and they are indeed wild places uh, the tamarind tree with its beautiful tank the dark exotic place where uh, there is a tryst between a young woman and a stranger that's a wild place and even the Kashrina grove uh, is, is a wild place where um, you know the adolescents gather together to experiment with all sorts of things right so it is a wild place which gets civilized quote unquote by um, democratic progress right so we will unpack chapter four um, shortly but i want you to kind of uh, read against the grain or or test certain concepts for yourself for instance this blurb calls um damodra asana as an old wanderer it's an exotic term isn't it old wanderer it takes us back to those narratives from the west and the east um you know uh, figures such as odysseus uh, Aeneas and, and all these mythic characters who wander, right, and uh, who meet with um, numerous adventures, and along the way they, they come to know more about life and, and, and the right uh, life and the righteous uh, living and things like that. So, um, the blurb is trying to fit Damodara Asan in that kind of tradition of mythic heroes, the, the wanderer figure right and and he is a wanderer because he comes and goes um you know from that small town he disappears one fine day and nobody's able to locate where exactly he has gone and we don't even know whether he is alive or dead and, and what kind of death did he uh, meet with so these are like uh, uh, a set of narratives of indeterminacy that we are uh, shown through this character of asan and, and I want you to kind of gather the details which contribute to such kind of characterization, right? So um, this is a way of life that we are shown from certain perspectives, isn't it? Certain perspectives and, and be very uh, certain about who is uh, narrating, who is capturing, who is describing and whether that is the representative view of that particular uh, town life in that era. Okay, when we read this novel, uh, we, if we want to kind of think about the genre of this uh, novel, we can call it as life writing, um, you know, the life writing of a particular youth in that point of time in that particular region of India. Right, so this is one version of life writing. So how do we see life writing? How do we define life writing? So I have an um, excerpt for you from uh, a couple of critics there. So our working definition of autobiographical or life narrative, rather than specifying its rules as a genre or form, understands it as a historically situated practice of self-representation. In such texts, narrators selectively engage their lived experience through personal storytelling located in specific times and places they are the same uh, they are at the same time in dialogue with the personal processes and archives of memory an interesting um, definition of uh, life writing so we have a narrator who is selectively engaging with life right this is unlike the meanings associated with a third person narrator in a, in a 19th century novel maybe, right? Where we have an omniscient uh, narrator who knows and uh, who knows about everything that's going on in that universe, right? But um, in life writing, uh, we understand that the narratives that are offered to us are selective, right? Specifically chosen keeping in tune with the attitudes and the philosophy of the particular narrator, right? So it's, it's a personal storytelling, right? Even though uh, we are given to understand that this Tamarind history uh, is trying to represent in its entirety the way of life, of a particular place in, uh, in, in Tamil Nadu at a particular time, we understand that this is selective representation of that period at that point of time. So this is not an universal rendering of all that has gone in that place at that point. It's selective, right? Um, 
and the narrator selectively engages with their lived experience through personal storytelling. So if you remember the previous section, one of the students was um, telling us that we realized that this is Damodra Asan's version of things, not others' versions of how things had gone about a particular event, right? There could be other narratives which are marginalized to highlight Asan's take on things. Right, there could be Joseph's, there could be other people's, right? So we do understand that these kind of selective representations are, um, you know, uh, sourced from personal processes and archives of memory, right? You have a personal history encoded in your mind. There is a personal uh, history, there is a personal archive made up of um, your own selective uh, choice of memory about a particular place and time, right? So uh, when we read certain uh, texts, we, we need to keep this idea in mind that this is perhaps not the homogenizing grand narrative of history, right? There are multiple alternative histories which are out there. We need to go to those certain um, narratives, other narratives to kind of piece together a, a bigger picture, not the uh, best picture, but a bigger picture. Right, so um, we we need to be conscious of that. Otherwise, we will get a very skewed representation of history and life. Okay, the other major concept um, that's a big subtext to this um, novel is the idea of urbanization. It's it's one of the major themes of this um, novel. The impact of modernity, the impact of modernization, the impact of um, democracy itself, right? Um, so picking up from what we uh, read in the previous class, we saw narratives of folklore, we saw narratives of legends, uh, which are prehistorical, and then we saw narratives of kings and maharajas, and then we have um, met with references to colonial regimes, and now we are uh, told about municipality and other democratic uh, units, right? So you can trace a trajectory where we can see uh, a nation from its infancy growing to its adolescence and maturity and, and, and moving on to the adulthood, metaphorically speaking, in, sta in terms of state structures, right? So, um, this is a political process which is rendered in uh, narrative and literary terms, right? It's rendered in narrative and literary terms. And when we come to uh, the period of modernity, modernization seems to be the biggest problematic. It seems to be the catalyst which is problematizing, complicating life for people and the landscape itself, right? So let's see what the theory of urbanization is uh, from today's point of view, and then we can go back to Tamaran history. This is Neil Bremer's uh, ideas. These are uh, Brenner's ideas. Um, the urbanization is today being actualized, albeit unevenly, on a worldwide scale, as well as in specific territories, regions, and places. And they explore some of the wide ranging intellectual, social, political, and environmental implications. This newly consolidated planetary formation of urbanization has blurred, even exploded, long entrenched socio spatial borders, not only between city and countryside, urban and rural, core and periphery, metropole and colony, society and nature, but also between the urban regional, national, global scales themselves, thereby creating new formations of a thickly urbanized landscape whose contours are extremely difficult, if not impossible to theorize and less to map, right? This is a phenomenon which is inevitable. It is inevitably happening on a worldwide scale. Its tentacles are everywhere and not unique to a particular region and it is complicating the relations between various entities which are listed there on, on the slide for you. I want to pick on society and nature as it is especially relevant to Tamaran history. Nature and society come to a head, right, uh, in this process of urbanization. 
especially in the chapter on uh, Kasharina Guru, right? Chapter 4, where we see, um, you know, through the eyes of the narrator, how wild and beautiful and free this place is access accessible to a wide section of that society and how suddenly once it has undergone some transformation, it becomes a rest restricted space. Right, with different rules coming into play to make sure that that space becomes accessible to uh, several participants. Right, so um, the in this kind of modernization, the relationship between all these um, entities becomes complex and no longer the way it used to be. What Ramasamy has tried to do is capture, um, you know the small life narratives of different sections of that populace and at the same time uh, bring out the contrast between this big entity of the past and uh, the modern present. Um, there are complications as well uh, in this attempt to chalk out a neat binary, right? Um, let me uh, go back to that description that um, Cornelius picked out for us on, on page 53 um, that list of things the youth engage in is, is interesting to read to put it mildly um, for 50 years or so he said he said it's again we need to realize Asan's version of things right uh, for 50 years or so, he said, local boys ha who had a streak of wildness to them would go to the grove and there they would take their first lessons in the art of sating the restlessness of youth. And the restlessness is listed out for you, right? Taking nature's command as a basic fact of life, they must have been amazed. These simple creatures by humanities shifts in mood, its inconsistencies, its millions and millions of desires of each and every kind, right? Uh, a very um, quick interpretation would be that this was how life was led in the wild nature in the past on the part of the boys who were quote unquote wild, right? So that's one way of looking at it. Um, another way of looking at it is that this grove offered a space to lead a life at its very basic, right? Um, so this is life at its very, very simple level where desires, physical desires of drinking intoxicating liquids, right? And, and indulging in um, the release of personal desires. These seem to be, uh, these seem to be the key trope associated with that particular wild space, right? Now contrast this space with that park which was established after demolishing or destroying or decimating the Kashrina Grove, okay? We have a wide array of the population enjoying that space. So what I'm trying to do is um, argue against this rhetoric that modernity is bad, uh, tradition is good, right? I'm, I'm doing it for argument's sake, right? This is also one other way of looking at things, right? So, in the absence of the Kashrina Grove, look at the number of people, different uh, people from different walks of life, enjoying that social space, right? It's a civilized social space of pleasure. We have lovers, we have the newlyweds. We have the pensioners, we have the professors, we have the students, right? Here's life, um, life's, uh, you know, plenty, right? So we, we need to recognize the positives which have also emerged from this kind of act of destruction, right? So that's, that's something we need to note and, and I agree with all the other points that has been uh, mentioned before uh, by Cornelius and there is a slant, there is an inevitable slant on the part of the narrator, on the part of uh, Damodra Asan, on the part of the Nadar uh, in, in the sense that they believe that this is, this modernity, this progress is not for the good and, and the narrator wants us to kind of sympathize with that rhetoric, we understand that and reasonably so, there are valid points 
um, which, which make us realize that this kind of destruction is unacceptable, the, the elimination of the beauties of nature are unacceptable, but we also need to kind of look at um, modernity in a more nuanced manner. In, in the kind of accessibility it offers to a whole lot of uh, the population, right? And, and let's just look at certain details. I, I love to do a little bit of uh, close reading as well to get a sense of the narrator's slant. Page 55, the tamarind tank was long gone and the bazaar and the bus stand in the south had already been built. The milling crowds and the loud roar of traffic tried to drown each other out. For most people, seeing the Kashmir trees right next to, the, to all these proud displays of modernity must have looked as inappropriate as seeing a fashionable young woman going off to college with her grandmother's jewels in her hair. Right? It was a time, you could say, when people got caught up in the idea of good taste and looked forward to the day when the trees would be gone. So he's telling us that the Kashrina grove itself has become an eyesore, an oddity, an awkward vestige from the past. Nature becomes a vestige of the past. It's like your grandmother's jewels that a fashionable young woman uh, wears on, on, uh, in, when she's going to college, right? It, it needs to be thrown out, right? It's not appropriate. So that's the kind of, um, that's the kind of perspective that these, um, ignorant modern, modernizers had in terms of viewing um, the presence of the cash rena grove. But I want us to think deeply about the metaphor, the analogy, the figurative parallel, right? The figurative parallel, the parallel to a fashionable young woman going off to college with her grandmother's jewels. And I was wondering about the appropriateness of the equivalence right could could we kind of um, reasonably compare Kashrina Grove to grandmother's jewels um, in in this kind of sense so I, I leave that uh, to your um, analysis right so think about that analogy whether it works whether it works whether it's suitable what further slants do you get from the narrator's point of view about a fashionable young woman going off to college right with these kind of paraphernalia Right? So think about it. And we can clearly see that that landscape engineer from Tanjavur is, is mocked, is satirized, and quite rightly so, in the way he manages the park and, and the pond and the artificial zoo. So uh, there's a lot of satire going on there. Uh, exotic varieties were, Im were even imported from overseas. There could be no room for ordinary plants like roses or different kinds of jasmine, right? Flowers like that must have been subjected to a total boycott. So jasmine, uh, indigenous, regional, flowering, uh, plant, all these are boycotted uh, in order to make space for exotic uh, imported uh, vegetation, right? Flowering vegetation. There's a lot of film criticism going on to interest in the narrative of uh, a film star who is um, unwell and look at the look at the topics for conversation among college going uh, youth you know uh, the emphasis uh, the different emphasis that they have about what interests them what concerns them most that tells you the kind of life that these youth led Right, and they were worried that the professor would spout some uh, kind of um, you know uh, poems from Tamil, and, and and they are relieved that he didn't do so. Right, um, so it, it's a it's a very uh, humorous portrait of society too. Right, and it kind of mocks the concerns of the young people of those uh, days too. There's there's a big chunk of uh, narrative on um, the idea of righteousness, um, hypocrisy, um, you know, uh, fake demeanors, and so on. And there is also a, a, a description on when to defy divine, divine commandments and the right principles. You know, there are certain moments where you can, uh, you know, reasonably uh, defy all these good principles. And there's a section on that in, on page 68. Um, 
I come to page 69, um, and this is to do with that park where um, there are um, equipments on which children play, the swings, the data daughters, and, and, and the slide, and so on. So uh, Cornelius very usefully gave us that contrast between the past where the wild boys just you know enjoyed that space used the tree branches as a swings and how the trees used to entertain these boys and now things have changed with modern lifeless equipment offering sources of enjoyment right so uh, there is that neat contrast uh, inevitable contrast and and there is also the problematic of all these slum kids occupying a lot of uh, those equipment and um, these kids being chased away by the caretaker right and again there is protest from that side protest from the parents of these kids um, the the underprivileged kids and and they have to work out a scheme in which there is an equitable share of enjoyment for every kid in the neighborhood so what do they do they come up with this idea of cues so there are cues before slides, they're accused before all these data daughters, they're accused before, um, you know, all kinds of equipment. And, and the boys get tired of waiting in a queue, right? And they switch between queues, ho hoping that, you know, that would be the uh, shorter queue and, and, and they want to go get at first to enjoy that particular equipment. So there are problem, practical problems in, in, in this kind of scheme, which is made to ensure that everybody gets their share, fair share of pleasure from this common space, right? It's common social civic space. Um, so we, we get that satire as well, how it is difficult in this democratic society to organize an equitable share of enjoyment for all sections of the community, right? Let me come to page 70. So this dance, he says, I'm, I'm reading excerpts, um, this dance of switching from Q to Q, right? He calls that a dance. This dance is a game in itself and the children jump back and forth in line as if they've come to the playground for that purpose alone. You know, their enjoyment of the slides or other equipment becomes secondary to the idea of jumping cues, uh, the idea of being in cues which is moving faster, right? That in itself becomes a game, a source of enjoyment for the uh, kids. When dusk starts to fall, the children towards the end of the line finally give up and start to head back home. They trudge along, discouraged, telling themselves that they are not coming back anymore to play at the playground. Look at the disillusionment, right? Because there is so much delay for the kids. They are back the next day because they are resilient being kids, right? They are back the next day. Yesterday's low spirits, no match for the current eagerness to play. They come running as fast as they can, trying to be first in any way possible. Stuck in the back of the lane, they wait. Tears well up in their eyes as the children dwell on their helpless plight. Again, there's dissolution. It's a kind of swing between emotions, right? David, the attendant, starts to walk away to go to the bathroom or smoke a cigarette, and they unite, cursing him to pieces. It's nobody's fault but his, they tell themselves, that things have gone so wrong. The times were changing fast, so clearly those days. The world seems like it was spinning at breakneck speed when the park replaced the Casuarina Grove. It seems like a dream when I think back on it now, and it also feels so real, right? So there is a kind of tragedy underlying this project of modernity, which we understand from reading this episode alone right you don't have to go far this episode in itself with the kids as the central participants we are told by the narrator how how much of a failure plot this plot of modernization in itself is right so there is the farcical there is the tragical there is this element of hope and optimism associated with this project of progress but there is also tears and disillusionment and loss of hope, right? My, my question is, yes, we understand that, but as, as very smart readers, our question should be, is this the right example to offer? Is this the right example to offer of the project of democracy, right? Is this the right example to offer about the project of modernization?
right? There should be a, 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 a kind of a, a balance. If this is a representative put rate, there should be a balance of um, the rendering of narratives of progress, right? Um, it cannot be a very crude distinction between past as good, the present as extremely bad, right? Um, so we, we need to understand that dynamic too in the representation of um, different trajectories of progress. So chapter five is an interesting chapter. I would call it the chapter which sows the seeds of dissension, real dissension in terms of the individual plot of this particular novel, right? We have this uh, large scale uh, narrative about society, large scale narrative about um, history, progress, but we also have a private narrative going on involving certain characters. Right? Uh, in that plot of individuals, this particular chapter is especially significant because it, it becomes the catalyst. It has elements which kind of sets the ball uh, rolling at breakneck speed, which, which kind of pushes the narrative to its teleology. So this chapter is significant for its narrative function. There is a reference to the bishop's house, um, the bishop's palace. His mansion is called the palace and he's a charitable man. He offers um, milk free of cost to the underprivileged kids in the neighborhood, right? That narrative is there and you can see the boys and the girls, the children walking to his house um, every day on a particular, a particular day on a week to get the supply of milk. And it's on a Thursday to be precise. And one fine Thursday or one rainy Thursday on their way, um, they come to this tamarind tree, which is full of pods, tamarind pods, right? And alongside this bunch of kids, we have a bunch of scavengers as well. Um, the scavenger men and women who congregate um, at the space near the tamarind tree where they are allotted jobs by the supervisors to go clean up you know particular uh, parts of the neighborhood and one of the women a very attractive um, women newly married uh, women uh, wants to eat a tamarind pot and she asks her husband to um, you know uh, get a pot down by, by throwing a stone at it and he does. And this kind of um, act makes everybody imitate that and then the boys and everybody starts to throw stones at the tamarind tree and the pods fall. They pick up the pods, they collect the pods and just, you know, uh, scoot from that area. They just escape from that area. So the entire harvest from the tamarind tree is gone. And who sets the ball rolling? It's a particular scavenger woman. Let's come to that section, page 73. There's a water pump at that junction located right next to the wall around the community park. A scavenger woman was sitting there indifferent to the damp ground around the pump. Given her age and youthful body, the fact she wasn't wearing a blouse under her sari was certainly not due to principle. A few children approached and stood close by, shifting their gaze between her and the man taking attendance. Her gaze was totally focused on the tamarind tree. So many pods on that one tree, the scavenger woman said. Yeah, they all oh, just hanging there. A little boy next to her said. He stood looking up at the tamarind tree. Raindrops splattered down. A tamarind pod fell right in front of the scavenger woman. The boy standing next to her saw it and immediately bent down and snatched it up. Give me half, my dear, my little prince. After wavering for a moment, the boy pinched off a piece and gave it to her. Right? And then she meets with another scavenger woman uh, and there's a conversation between the two. So did you get sick this morning? Oh my God, I threw up so badly. My stomach was all knotted up. When I woke uh, up this morning and there it went, she said, dragging the fruit hard against her tongue. The younger woman studied the way she was souring the tamarind stays with keen interest. Is it really sour? Oh God, yes, it's sour, really sour. It hits you in the brain. And then the young woman turned away and walked into the group of men. In the middle of the crowd stood a young, well-built scavenger wearing a khaki shirt. She came up to him and tapped him on the soldier on the on the shoulder, whispering something to him while pointing at the tree. He left the crowd and walked over. She followed behind him. 
The young scavenger looked in either direction, then checked once more to be sure. Next to the pump lay a pile of gravel meant for repairing the road. He picked up a pebble from it, took aim with his left forefinger and let it fly. A dozen or so pots showered down. The other women went over to their husbands and whispered to them sweetly. Many more scavengers approached, threw rocks at the tree. Right. The children who, were hes uh, who had hesitated before they were worried the scavengers would start a fight if they threw rocks at the tree, now threw them with abandon. The skinny ones and the scavenger women gathered the pods. Then a group of kids coming from Vadiveshwaram arrived at the Tamarind Tree Junction and they and the scavengers who had previously been standing off to the side all started to throw rocks as well. The tamarind pots came showering down. Everyone gathered as many as they could. The children filled their milk pails with tamarind. Police, one mischievous rascal shouted when nobody was expecting it. The boys immediately took off, yelling Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. They ran a quarter of a mile before they realized it was false alarm. This is like an upending of the narrative of Eve in the Garden of Eden, right? It, it, it kind of has a, a, a kind of a archetypal echo of that narrative of this subversive woman, the, the problematic um, you know, gender which is sowing the seeds of discord and from now on there is a, there's a spiraling, there's a downward spiral of things in this world. Right, so you can see how um, you know the the world making of this novel comes to a close, and and it, from this point on, we get uh, narratives, histories of individual figures, tradesmen, especially, and everything is somehow connected to this particular uh, significant act of um, you know uh, theft. We need to think about the description of the scavenger women too. They're all very attractive. They're all very attractive, right? And even back in chapter four, go back to the description of the women, right? You can see that it's the sexuality that gets um, enhanced, that's highlighted through the narrator's description. So we need to think about in a, in a larger way, in a broader way, what is the function of such description in relation to female identity. What purpose, what function does this kind of representation serve in terms of the larger purpose of the novel? You need to think about that. And again, the other question that I want you to find answers to is this, what is the significance of this slogan? Um, when when uh, somebody says police, the boys cry, Ga Gandhi G K, um, you know Gandhi G K J, and they and they run away. What is the significance, right? The implication is that they still have that colonial hangover, right? The colonial hangover that the police are the colonial police, and and the you know the boys running away are somehow linked to the indigenous protesters, um, the freedom fighters, right? Of course. That's just the analogy, that's just the cultural parallel, but things are so different, right? Things are so different in terms of state of affairs. It's the boys who are thieving, the scavengers who are thieving, and then um, the authorities or the authorities established by the democratic nation, right? So, uh, but we have all these hangovers, vestiges from the past, right? Um, still ingrained deep in the mind of the populace, right? So, who is uh, responsible for the threat of the tamarind pots? That, that is the big question to which you, you know the answer, the scavengers, um, especially the scavenger women, right? Now, chapter 6. Um. So, uh, in chapter 6, uh, we find something pretty interesting because if we trace it back with the chapter 5, uh, there is a, a certain link which I personally, after reading both the chapters, uh, is interested to look at. It's like uh, specifically in the chapter 6 we look at a tradition of auction which is actually uh, I mean taken care of by the municipality because the tamarind tree um, at the crossroads located at the crossroads is a property of the municipality from which uh, uh, the municipality de derives revenue and income in terms of uh, selling the pods to the merchants and the businessmen in and around the locality. 
in this chapter we look at uh, certain individuals who are actually uh, uh, they are primary uh, to make the auction successful and uh, it looks at the business class or the upper class of people who are actually there to uh, buy the tamarind pods in order to help the municipality to work for the sake of the locality and the society. And uh, throughout the story, we find that uh, there is this character Mutha Pillai and Abdul Ali Sahib, who are the two most passionate competitors in course of the auction. And the people around the common folk, they are pretty much um, fascinated and they are always very interested to look forward to them. The act of the auction is something more of a tradition than only a business transaction because it goes on for around 25 years. Except one unpredictable situation which happens on the 26th year when um, on the day of the auction, um, surprisingly the pods from the trees get disappeared and um, uh, the person who is uh, responsible for uh, taking over the auction that is Vallinaya Gampillai, he goes to the police station in order to file a report about uh, assuming it to be an act of theft. Now this is where I feel it is very interesting with chapter 5 because um, in chapter 6 only the upper class people or the business class, class people are the ones who are uh, entitled to buy the tamarind pods and they are the, uh, the most valid question which reverberates throughout the chapter 6 is that who is responsible for the theft. If we go back to chapter 5 we will see the common folk, the scavengers and the children who are there who have actually uh, taken the opportunity, to, opportunity of breaking down the tamarind pods by throwing stones. So, it is kind of an assumption on my part, but somewhere or the other I feel that these two chapters are linked somewhere where the common people who are actually scavengers, who are the unprivileged class people, uh, they get the opportunity to have their taste for the tamarind pods while on the, uh, since the last 25 years through this act of auction, this uh, tamarind pods or the right to tamarind pods is actually validated to the upper class. So, uh, I feel that uh, in that sense chapter 5 and chapter 6 can be read as a kind of a pair piece and that is how chapter 6 ends where uh, uh, one of the very interesting facts about chapter 6 at the end which I, uh, I should uh, mention here is that Mutha Pillai actually uh, comments on something that is a very very ironic comment according to the social sensibility. He anticipates the modern society there, I will be quoting that. It is like uh, this is exactly how it is in page 89, it is in the middle. So, look this is exactly how the country is going to be run from now on. They are going to pick us clean cradle to grave. As far as I know the auction has gone on since 1928 for the past 25 years, two and a quarter pa uh, panams. Uh, Let us see, yes nine chakrams and the whole thing was mine. This is the very first year the auction has fallen through, henceforth it will be the same story. You go walking and someone rips the Veshti right of your waist, ask why and he will tell you that it is his second, second Veshti and anyway he saw you wearing a loincloth. Ten people can see it happen and they will all support him. So, this is a pretty much uh, ironical comment about he anticipating how the modern society is going to be. Perhaps he is a little bit insecure that um, the common people is actually trying to grab what he usually is entitled to. So, in this uh, chapter also the writer brings a little bit of struggle between the upper class and the lower class about rights and um, who is entitled to what. So, in that sense he actually sets some more problematic and complicated uh, and uh, much more uh, socially sensible narrative which is going to I think uh, uh, roll into the narrative further in course of the novel. Okay, uh, Sanchar has hit the high notes um, of this chapter and kind of touched on the the conceptual uh, battles between two entities, the haves and the have nots. Um, so, uh, I will just go back to certain uh, uh, areas to kind of um, accentuate that, reiterate that. It is on page uh, 77, every goat herd in town depended on the municipality's banyan trees to feed his animals. It was an attractive site to raising goats. Using the municipality's banyan leaves to feed them and keeping the milk, it was also very profitable. Right? It is an interesting way of looking at things. Um, you can get a sense of the slant of the narrator when you kind of look at the way he analyzes 
the benefits that these goat herds derive um, through uh, the way they exploit the municipality's goods, right? I, I just want to bring your attention to that episode, the way he interprets, right? So uh, think about it. So there's a, a detailed narrative of how this auction, uh, auction is done, right? So it's, it's very interesting from a cultural point of view. So uh, you can go uh, and read that detail by detail. It tells you how life was led in terms of all these um, uh, kind of trading uh, rites of passage, right? So it's, it's a cultural curiosity. You can, you can go uh, read those and look at the way the, the crowds lionize uh, the big tradespeople, such as Mutapale, they say he's a god, he's a monster. Look at his um, tactics, the strategies that he employs to get, um, you know, the uh, proceeds of the tamarind tree. So you can see the, the response of the crowd as well. It becomes a spectacle, a, a, a spectacle which brings the community together for the benefit of these big businessmen, right? These farm holders, such as Mutapale and, and Abdul Sahib. Okay, page 86. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, 85. Um, Valina Agampilai doesn't know that the pods have gone, right? They have been stolen. He's on the way to the uh, space of the auction, right? And um, there are a couple of people who are sniggering at him and, and he goes to have a conversation. Ayupan turned away towards the store and howled with laughter. Um, and he says, I'm going to the auction. Oh, the auction, what's it going to bring this year? 45 rupees by my estimate. Really? It'll go up that much? It was a very good, e good yield this year. Kuli Ayapan nearly doubled over at this point, quickly slipped behind the shop. A howl of laughter pierced the air. Hey, you stupid scavenger, what's the big joke? Someone dancing without their clothes on? Walinaigam barked at him angrily. Kuli Ayapan ran towards the entrance to the municipal park, his hands, his hand clamped firmly over his mouth. He's still trying to control his laughter. Valinayagan Pillai face darkened with rage. He's furious. Now, sir, there's no need to get angry, says Damu, said Damu, uh, the, the storekeeper. No, I've been watching him for a while now. Always the same stupid grin on that boy. One look at that idiot. I feel like slapping him. He's going to find himself under my thumb one of these days. I'll show him. Go ahead and laugh if you want. So you can see the, the anger on the part of this municipal employee towards that coolie ayapin. And, and you can see how this narrative of progress have has strengthened him to laugh, to snigger at figures of authority, mock figures of authority such as Valinayagam Pillai, right? And he cannot understand, he cannot tolerate that kind of reaction on the part of a coolie. And he says, one of these days, I will show him, I'll bring him under my thumb. So there is a power struggle between these two groups, right? Um, and, and that becomes manifest through such interactions. And from now on, you will see how this uh, struggle erupts between these two classes, right? That's how the no novel is going to proceed from, from this point on. And I'm very uh, happy that um, Sanchar brought out um, the, the perspective that for the first time, 25 years down the line, we have these underprivileged uh, classes, the scavengers who have been cleaning up this place, taking a moment to kind of, um, you know, uh, enjoy the proceeds of the tamarind tree, right? For all these years, it has gone to all these big business people, and for the first time, these uh, scavengers get to enjoy these uh, lush uh, products of that um, tamarind tree. So that uh, perspective is neatly uh, mentioned by um, Sanchar. Page 88. And then there is a discussion about there's a discussion about how and why things have gone wrong, right? And the simple answer is there are too many masters these days, right? Uh, page 88. Um, before this, there was only one man ruling our kingdom. Now look, there are 10 men running things, too many centers of authority. Oh, is that what you mean? Is that what I mean? One kingdom, one man should speak, others listen. It's insane, all this fooling around. Take my house. If I talk, my wife talks, my children talk, my driver talks, my maid talks, and my, servants, uh, my servant talks. Who's doing the listening? You hear what I'm saying to you, right? There shouldn't be a dispersal of um, spaces of authority, right? It should be concentrated on uh, a limited number of figures, say one, that's better, according to the speaker here. So you can see how they're trying to make sense of how and why things have gone wrong in this country. 
right. And um, the, the same except that um, Sanchar pointed out um, Mutapillai's uh, argument, right. Uh, his rationalizing, his, his, his um, attempt to come um, and make sense of things that have gone wrong is pretty interesting. It's very, very interesting um, the way he understands. He's, he has a lot of resentment, you know, he has a lot of resentment within his heart and he says, we are going to be ripped off, totally ripped off by these fellows. They're going to, uh, you know, remove our vestes that we are wearing and they're going to kind of uh, take away all our property. And that's the way it's going to be because this is a, a new country. This is a democratic country. This is a country which is progressing and our power, our properties are going to be, um, you know, thieved, are going to be robbed by these um, people. So that is the resentment which is making him talk all these uh, ideas. That's why he says, um, you go walking, someone rips the waist right off your waist and 10 people can see it happen and they will all support him. The common mass is on the side of all these people who are robbing us. So you can see how that um, pyramid with, uh, with a, a hierarchical pyramid is, is getting destroyed, is, is, in the pro pro is in the progress of being damaged by all these different classes which are underprivileged, right. And there are other examples from the same chapter to uh, point out the struggle between the classes because things have changed structures of power have changed there is a democratization of space and, and you can see that in the in the chapter where the children get access to the park as well how the slum children do come back into the picture how the parents protest bring them back and get them to enjoy and that um, pleasure is not the privilege of only the upper elite right so I'll, I'll stop here um.